Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last presentation of Thursday Student Scholar Day. We're going to save the best for last, I hope. We're all very excited to see what you're working on with Legos. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Adams and his student. So, hello, thanks for coming. Um, today, uh, you'll be hearing a talk uh, by Rafe Paulson. Uh, Rafe is a senior student uh, graduating this, uh, this spring with a degree in mathematics with an emphasis in physics. Um, and he um, is a local from the valley. I was just fortunate enough to, to pick him up uh, for this project and uh, race doing some wonderful work on this Lego based spectrometer. Um, I, I've just basically given him some tools and he's, he's taken it from there. So uh, I hope you all enjoy the talk. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll introduce Race Talk Building an Automated Lego Based Spectrometer. And I'll turn the floor over to him. Thank you, Dr. Adams. So this initially began when uh, Dr. Adams approached me, uh, was it a year ago, and was asking if I would be interested in creating such a device just using simple, uh, inexpensive uh, Legos and uh, microcontrollers to create a spectrometer. So that's where this all really began. So, building an automated Lego-based spectrometer. So, the points that I'm going to cover today, I'm going to cover the purpose of this project. I also think it would be good to go over what a spectrometer is, considering we'll be talking about that for the next 20 minutes. Uh, kind of how they function, the mechanics and application, and then I'll get into the Lego spectrometer. So, the purpose. Can a inexpensive spectrometer be built using uh, Legos and a microcontroller and simple circuits? And can it be applied to an upper divisional chemistry course, such as instrumental analysis? All chemists must take this class to graduate, so this would give them a chance to get their hands dirty, get their hands on, uh, and actually learn, instead of just putting a sample, pushing a button, and hey, I got a graph. So this will increase their learning. It'll, it'll challenge their learning. So the, my goals are actually try to get this spectrometer working uh, just using Legos and a microcontroller and also to incorporate it into a four to six week lab for instrumental analysis. So to begin, uh, spectrometers are used in spectroscopy. What is spectroscopy? Well it is the study of the electromagnetic spectra and you might wonder what is that? Well a good example is the rainbow, the different colors. You know, you got Roy G. Biv, so red through violet. So that is actually electromagnetic waves. And so it, and, uh, spectroscopy is actually looking into these interactions, what light is actually doing with matter and what's going on on the molecular level. So a UV biz spectrometer is an instrument that can measure absorption and transmission of a particular wavelength, or in other words, a particular color. So uh, and the visible range, keep in mind, is 390 nanometers through 700 nanometers. So we're talking really small, you know, a billionth of a, a meter. So th this is extremely small. Uh, yeah, continue on. So uh, understanding of, of absorbance is necessary. So let's take, for example, red Kool-Aid, everybody's favorite drink. So why is it red? There's, it's actually, there's a lot more than just it just being red. There's some cool science that actually exists. And so, if you were to be drinking a glass of uh, red Kool-Aid and look at it through the light, be like, oh hey, I'm just getting red light through. White light's coming in, and then red light's coming out. So, some of the light's being transmitted, so the light coming through, and some of the light's being absorbed. And so, as you can see in this diagram here, white light, which consists of all the colors of the spectrum, comes into this Kool-Aid absorbing material and comes out, uh, some, of it, some of it being transmitted, such as the red here, and some of it being absorbed. As you can see, the green is being absorbed. That's why it has this red characteristic. It absorbs the complementary colors. So, um, okay, so the basic mechanics behind the spectrometer, we have a light source, it could be an LED, an incandescent bulb, anything that produces white light. It'll radiate out, it'll hit this lens and be collimated, which means all the light is going to be going in a column shape, kind of the same direction. 
from the lens it's going to go to an IR filter which is going to filter out unwanted light, infrared light which we can't see so it'll either be deflected or absorbed in this filter. From the filter it's going to continue on to a diffraction grating. The diffraction grating acts as a prism in this case, it breaks apart the components or I'm sorry, white light into its components, so uh, uh, ROG Viv. And from the diffraction grating, we have this rainbow that projects onto a rotating mirror. And so this rotating mirror could then turn and adjust, uh, and it basically moves from left to right or right to left, depending on which way it goes. And the light will travel then through a little slit, so we're actually isolating uh, a particular color. You know, it could be red or green. And when this particular color goes in, it's going to go through a cuvette sample, like what I talked about, Kool-Aid, for example, could be the sample. And then it's going to then go to a detector, which will determine if the light was being transmitted or absorbed. And from the detector, we can <coughs> use the data analysis to get an absorption curve, which is, that's what's called. So spectrometers, where are they found? It, when I think of spectroscopy, I just think of astronomy right away, elemental analysis. So we have these uh, telescopes up, up in space that could observe uh, stars or other stars uh, besides our sun. For example, the Kepler, uh, Kepler spacecraft actually observes a very small portion of the sky. It actually finds Earth-like planets around other stars. And the way it does that, it, some of the light passes through the atmosphere of this planet. And from that, it could do some analysis and be like, oh, it's 70% nitrogen, 30% uh, carbon dioxide, or et cetera. So, and it's also using chemistry for chemical properties. You're able to find chemical bond lengths. And you could also find concentration of a sample. Like, a concentration is how much stuff is actually mixed in with water. Um, and also, in this, and what I did was finding absorp absorptions of particular colors. And this is a picture of an actual spectrometer. It's, it's pretty small and it's a very neat little device. So. But on to my LEGO spectrometer. So let me plug it in real quick. Okay, so What's going on here? Like the previous diagram suggested, we have a light source, a high-powered LED, goes through a lens, IR filter, then it's gonna go through this diffraction grating. The diffraction grating will then, uh, be, the light will kind of bend towards this mirror in which it's gonna pick up the full spectrum. This little stepper motor, which actually it's turning right now, is gonna slowly rotate as such, project onto this uh, slit here, and from the slit is a very, it's a very small, tiny gap. So we're able to isolate what color we're actually looking at, and so, and then the cuvette actually goes right there, our sample. From there, the photodiode is going to read: Is this absorbing or transmitting? And this is a microcontroller, the brains of the whole operation. Okay, so this spectrometer, it's, con uh, it's components are as a high-powered LED, which is right here, a uh, light-emitting diode, in other words. It, uh, it's not like your typical LED that you find in electronics class or that you're, you might be accustomed to hearing, but it actually requires a driver, which uh, allows this LED to pull a very steady current so the LED doesn't burn out. And also there's a heat sink here, so all the heat will dissipate then your, your LED won't, you know, it's not likely to burn out. And also we have, here's a rotating mirror with the stepper motor. So the stepper motor is going to take very precise, repeatable steps. So it'll take one step, and then another, and then it could go back. Very precise. Also, here is a picture of a cuvette with a red solution, which was used. Here is this uh, photodiode circuit. It's a very simple circuit. It actually uses a little op amp. So this is actually the detector. It's going to be like, hey, this is being a, uh, absorbed or transmitted, or uh, I'm not getting any light. And here is the brains of the whole operation. It's controlling the stepper motor and the photodiode. And it's synchronized so it all works together. Like, 
like a, a band or something. The music has to start all together and it has to all end together. It all has to be, work together, otherwise you don't know where you're at, what color you're looking at. And looking at a, a quick cost analysis, adding up all, all the costs of each different component, we're under $140. So, and keep in mind that our actual spectrometer costs you know, maybe 2,500, but more like 3,000, 4,000. So this is very cheap or inexpensive compared to the actual spectrometer. And actually students could break apart this and actually look at it. You know, you don't want your students to be dissecting your, your really expensive equipment and I don't know, potentially harming something or themselves. So, okay, before I get into the actual results of my spectrometer, I like to go over just a, some an example data analysis. So on this graph over here, we have this light is being transmitted. So basically, each point is like the stepper motors taking one step, takes a data point, plots it, takes another step, plots another point. And so you get all these steps with all these points. And this right here is showing an example of transmission. So this is a blank solution, such as water. You know, white light goes in, white light comes out. It, it doesn't absorb any colors. It, water is very clear. And so it takes a blank run as such. And then here is a sample example. Say that we put a Kool-Aid in again. So actually, it, so it's red. So it's absorbing some color. It has some color characteristics to it. So as you can see here, it actually dips down around the 500 nanometer length. So this, uh, this indicates that the solution has a color to it. It's not clear as water. And from this, we're able to produce a absorb absorption curve. It's a, using a simple equation. So basically, this is saying at this area, this is where the most absorption is happening. So it peaks at around 500 nanometers. And hey, that's very similar to where red light absorbs. It absorbs green color. Okay, so to ensure that my device was working properly, I, I ran a simple experiment. I used a red dye, a, a blue dye, a green dye, and I took three runs of each dye. Uh, prior to putting the sample dye in, into the spectrometer, I, I ran a blank sample of methanol, which is the solvent of these dyes in this case. Uh, methanol is similar to water in, in the sense that it is clear. It doesn't absorb any colors. You, the white light goes in, white light comes out. So there, it has no color characteristics. So I would run a, run a blank sample with methanol. Then I would add 15 drops of a specific dye, such as red or blue or green. And, from, and then I would run, run, a, 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 run another run of the spectrometer. And from the blank and then the specific dye, I'd be able to produce an absorption curve. And from, uh, yeah, th this would let me know what colors are being absorbed. So uh, uh, as for results, as you can see, these, these kind of squiggly lines here are my LEGO spectrometer. So this is the absorption curve, so where it peaks, that's where it's absorbing the most. As you can see, it's actually peaking around uh, 510 nanometers. The actual, uh, or let me say, uh, I use a commercial spectrometer to see the accuracy of my device. And so this bottom curve here is a, is a commercial spectrometer. So you can take that as the actual value of which the red dye should be absorbing, which it peaks around uh, 520 nanometers. So it was off by about uh, 10 nanometers. And looking at the blue dye, again here the squiggly lines are my Lego spectrometer. This bottom smooth line is uh, the commercial spectrometer. As you can see, they peak in similar areas. Uh, they peak around 600 nanometers. So Again, that, that's a characteristic of a blue. That's what we'd expect. So uh, I was happy to see that it, it looks somewhat similar. I mean, of course, there's a lot of noise going on there. In the green dye, here would be a, okay, so here would be a good example of 
uh, getting too much noise in the device, so probably stray light would cause these real jagged uh, shapes. The actual spectrometer peaks around 700, so as you can tell, this is some areas to improve the device, limiting the light pollution that exists in, within the spectrometer. So in conclusion, yes, an inexpensive UV Viz spectrometer can be created just using solely Legos and an Arduino microcontroller. And it also has promise to be applied to a four to six week lab for instrumental analysis. In areas where I'd like to improve this device, uh, I would like to improve its repeatability. As you could tell, each run was kind of, I, I would like them to be closer together. It's, they kind of seem too independent of each other. They should be similar curves. And also improving light shielding. As you can see, those real jagged lines. That was an example of uh, poor light shielding. So, you know, you pick a sunny day and it wouldn't, it would be less accurate than if it was just in pitch dark. And also it would be fun to uh, create some 3D Lego, uh, I'm sorry, 3D printed uh, custom parts such as uh, being able to hold the lens. I, I found that the Legos weren't the best for holding lenses. And also it would be fun to apply to the rotating mirror as well. I also would, uh, would like to add a photodiode array, which would just eliminate the use of the rotating mirror. Basically, the light would uh, be collimated, and then it, it would uh, be diffracted, actually go through a sample, and instead of having one photodiode, you'd have several, like uh, 24, and so the, the spectrum actually could shine just on this uh, a skinny piece that consists of many photodiodes. And uh, yeah, I'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Adams for approaching me with this. This was, I had a lot of fun, I learned a lot, and uh, I'd also like to thank the physics department for letting me uh, pillage the electronics lab. I, I went down countless times looking for parts that I needed, and they were more than happy to help. Also the, the chemistry department for letting me use their lab. and. Uh, yeah, just answer any questions that I needed. And most importantly, thank all of you for coming to listen to my presentation. Uh, do any of you have any questions? Are you just, huh? How many nanometers per step did your spectrometer take? It was uh, 0.65 nanometers per step. Dr. Neary? So with respect to the, the photodiode that you use, is the re response to the, for the photodiode pretty uniform across the entire physical spectrum? Did you have to worry about that at all? Uh, so for the detector, I actually used three different detectors until I came across this photodiode, which seemed to be, offer the best results. I actually used more complex uh, circuit. With the photodiode, it offered too much noise. It was very wasn't consistent. I would get some high values and some low values. And I tried a photoresistor and uh, it, again it didn't offer the correct sensitivity. This actual circuit, it, it seemed to uh, capture a, a very precise, uh, what I want to say, it's very precise. You would step by and it would actually catch your shadow and the, the raw data value would actually drop. So it was fairly consistent. It was the most consistent that I tried. So of the different uh, detectors I tried. Can you show you exactly how little I know about a microcontroller and um, ask, how does that get converted into the data that built those curves? Is, was there programming that was also involved? Uh, so with a microcontroller, you actually uh, program. It could uh, run automated, uh, anything automated that you like. Uh, it'll, it, it requires a little bit of coding. And also I used Excel for the graph, so I'd actually the microcontroller would give me a raw data value. I would take that raw data value and put it into Excel. And so, does that answer your question? Yeah, I just didn't know if it was set up so that it populated like an Excel file or how, how that got translated to your output. 
it actually would display, it'll give you the step that it's on, and then it'll give you raw data value, and it'll go through 480 steps. And so, so you... are writing each of those down. Yeah, yeah, and it actually puts it in columns, which is very nice, so. Any other questions? Well, for those who may not know, what's an Arduino? Arduino it is a type of microcontroller. There are many different types of microcontrollers, such as BASIC. Arduino seems to be uh, fairly popular. It's open source, meaning you can just get on the internet and download it. It's not going to cost you anything. And they're fairly cheap, too. So, uh, But yeah, there are many different brands of microcontroller. I just picked Arduino. And Arduino interfaces with your computer, right? I mean, that's what, that's, yeah. Yeah, so it, it actually has a little program that runs on it, or on the computer, I should say. Well, if there's no more questions, I guess we should thank Barry.